Three things I hope to accomplish this morning from this message, three goals that I wish that you would take from this message. And the first one is, I want you to know that I want to encourage your hearts to give God praise without any regrets. I want you to know that I want you to, in, to be empowered to open up your spirits to embrace praising God without reservations fully. And finally, my goal of this message is to enlarge your mind so that you may glorify God by making his name great without the fear of rejection. Three things I hope that this message is able to accomplish this morning, but there's just a few things that are bothering. I don't know about you, but I am fully perplexed as to why a war is going on in Ukraine and executive orders have been signed in the law. I am puzzled by the constant lies from people who lead our country who have strategically used the media to manipulate the masses. I am personally pricked by the oppression placed upon those who have different ways of worshiping God. I don't know about you, my brothers and sisters, but I have been somewhat paralyzed by the disparities between the millions of people who are openly accepted into this nation and then they're still rejecting people of color. These things bother me. They get on my nerves because no one explains to us what's really going on. We're in 2022. Why would anybody want to take over somebody else's country in the midst of a pandemic? And I know that we are the land of the free. And I know that we've had leaders who had a problem with people coming to our country illegally. But how can we determine that we'll accept some folk but reject others? We have political parties who spend a whole lot of energy fighting about stuff that we don't know anything about what they're fighting about. And they tell me that if you go into one of the local restaurants that happen to have one of the right kind of beverage bars in it, you'll find the same Democrats and Republicans who are arguing in the Capitol building, who are arguing in the Senate committee, be making side deals over some scotch and some lobster or lamb chops. I know this is the nation's capital. This is the most important city in the whole wide world. But some stuff make you scratch your head sometimes. How in the world can we live in this country, in the capital city, and in all cities there is 10 cities, but why do we have so many in Washington, D.C.? How in the Gehenna can we have disparities in the city of Washington, D.C.? The most powerful city in the world. And right downtown near the monuments and around these beautiful Buildings built by black people, we still have people living in tents. We're in the midst of a pandemic, people. And I know that I've been to school, but this just, this for us, ain't nobody filling up these buildings no more. We got empty buildings and full underpasses. We got more people staying home then they are actually going into the job and the same people find no room in their heart for a building that they're still paying for 
Lights that they're still paying for, gas and air conditioning and heat and taxes and maintenance as well as somebody to supervise these places. And those same people say it's a shame that people have to live in tents and forget that some of those same people help build their empire. And now, we have to look at our own brothers and sisters in humanity, hurting in areas and in places that sometimes we take for granted. Sister Thornhill, I'm, 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 I'm bothered by the fact that in the midst of a pandemic, Deacon Coley, Billionaires made more money than they've ever made. In a pandemic, people are dying by the numbers and we can't even keep up with the count. And yet, billionaires, billionaire, billionaires are profiting off of somebody else's pain. It's enough to make you want to throw up your hands and give up. It's enough to make you want to quit. It's enough to make you want to lose hope. It's enough stuff going on around that'll just make you want to quit. We were in a meeting on Saturday, executive team, and got a report from the neighborhood. And there is an uptick in violent crimes around the church. Stuff is happening around the church. And, and, and for those who had a problem with my position, one reason why I don't want you to leave before we all leave because ain't nobody outside watching you. Because if you leave too early, we, ain't, we haven't covered you with the benediction and you are subject to put yourself as a victim outside because ain't nobody outside watching who's moving around. I wish I had somebody who understood exactly what I was trying to say. Isn't it bad that we can't even leave church without having to worry about somebody doing something to us? However, there is some good news. God still gives us some glimpses of his grace. In the midst of all that's going on, God is still good. Paul in our text this morning got on my nerves when I was studying this. Have y'all ever read the Bible and stuff just got on your nerves? Oh, I'm, I'm, I, I must be talking to just preachers, but, 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 but some of the stuff that Paul does in chapter 8 just blows my mind. I mean, chapter 8 of Romans, it's, it's full of empowerment. It's, it's full of things that Paul wants to share with us. He, he has some things in there. And when I was reading it and going through it, I said all Paul was trying to help us to understand is that we ought to give God praise without any regret. We ought to give God praise without feeling guilty about it because Paul opens our minds individually and collectively to see that God has been doing some marvelous things in chapter 8. But I argued with Paul for a couple of reasons. Number one, Paul, how in the world could you put so much preaching in one chapter? I was looking, I was looking at the text. I was enjoying the text. I was trying to get my lesson in. And I don't know about you. Have you ever been just reading one scripture and the next scripture start waving at you? I know I'm a little animated pastor, can be a little crazy, but, but when I'm studying, I have to tell the other sermon, hush, be quiet, I'm just focusing on one thing. Just, I was arguing with Paul. I said, Paul, let me tell you something. There ain't no way in the world that you have to put so many sermons in this text. It's only a few verses, but every verse every comma, every colon and semicolon and every period was a sermon. I mean, I, I mean, Paul is shifting and moving through this chapter. Can I help you? Have you ever looked at Romans 8 all by itself? I mean, listen how it opens up. 
Therefore, there is no condemnation. That's enough to preach all month long. Paul is saying there is no condemnation. Then he moves from no condemnation to there is no damnation. Once you hook up with Jesus, hell is no longer on the agenda. I wish I had somebody here. Paul zips from no damnation to then there ought not be no frustration. I mean, if you don't have no condemnation, you ain't got to worry about no damnation, then why are you having some frustration? Uh, he goes from frustration to then there's no depletion. Everything we need, we already got it in Jesus Christ. Then he whisks from no depletion, and then he says there's no deviation. <laughs> God has already set your life in order. So regardless of the detours, they're not a deviation. They're just a delay to your destiny. I wish I had somebody in here. He, he, he moves from depletion to no deviation. And then he shifts to there is no subjugation. Sin no longer can subjugate you under its power. And, he, and, then, and then he shiftly closes and says, now after all that, I need to tell you, there is no separation. I mean, if I just talked about them things alone, I'd be here a whole month preaching. Let's know all the other stuff that Paul puts in there. You know, verse number 28, and we know that all things. I, that's enough. All? I mean, everything. The good and the bad, the wars in Ukraine, as well as the celebrations around at the Kennedy Center, all. The good times and the bad times, the ups and the downs, all. You mean to tell me when I'm feeling good and when I'm feeling bad, all. You mean to tell me when people agree with me and when they disagree with me, all. Paul said all things work together. Then he says, oh, oh, then he messed me up. He say, even though it appears, even though it feels like you a sheep going before the slaughter, he says, and we are conquerors. Even in the midst of our lowest state of living or being, God, God says through Paul, you are more than a conqueror. So can you understand why I have a problem with Paul? I mean, Paul, I mean, really, Paul, this is a whole lot that you're talking about in verse 8, chapter 8. But our text says, Paul is convinced that praise ought to animate from your life because God has decided to label you as not guilty. <sighs> there is a whole lot of stuff that we're guilty of. And I know that transparency is good, but sometimes transparency can be problematic. And I'm not going to expose mine because I don't want you judging me, and I'm not going to ask you to expose yours because I don't want to know your business that much. But we all are guilty of something. Paul says, God, in the foreknowledge before your mama met your daddy, had already decided that you were going to be not guilty. <sighs> I, I, I know some of us are guilty of telling little lies and big lies. Some of us are guilty of paying our taxes or trying to get around our IRS. Some of us are guilty of taking a sip and then some of us are taking a whole bottle or a whole winery. We, we, we've said some stuff. We've done some stuff that's been problematic to other people. We've, we've acted certain kind of ways. But guess what? God said you are not guilty in his eyes. We are responsible for how we treat one another. Yes, we are accountable for how we love and respect and honor and work with one another. Yes, but God says, I have put you in the position that I look at you and you are not guilty. Paul said over in Romans, all, chapter 3, Around verse 23, 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory. So now Paul told us about all. Then he gets to verse chapter number eight and tell us, God said, you're not guilty. Paul, like you and I, have been having some sleepless nights, insomnia, and broken rest. Now I, I like this thing they got now. Uh, it's called the nap ministry. Anybody, everybody, anybody ever been involved in the nap ministry? 
the nap ministry, the, the best way that you know that it's time to have nap ministry is when you've come to worship and given God your all, and when you get home, you gotta take a nap. I mean, if you ever call me at one o'clock on Sunday, you're not gonna get an answer. Cause by, 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 by one o'clock on Sunday, Brother D'Angelo, I've had some of my chicken and my herb rice and some string beans and my sweet tea. And family and friends and loved ones know on Sunday, do not call daddy unless it's a national emergency between one and six. Because that is the preacher's nap time. Anybody ever known anything about having a nap after church? Anybody ate so good and had worship so good that you had to go home and take a nap? Nap ministries, Paul, is going on. And Paul says, Smith, I understand, but this is what I need for you to know. Chapter 8 is full of victory, full of hope, encouragement, and power. Paul is doing something to help us understand. Do you know that people are watching you? You are blowing some people's mind. When I look around this room and I've listened to the testimonies and I've been living long enough to know that y'all have been through some stuff that have wiped some other people out and off the map. And here you are, still going. 